Okay, so today we're talking about misunderstood mammals with the Black Mammologist Week live panel. And if you don't know what Black Mammologist Week is about, it's about pretty much connecting current and aspiring Black mammologists and celebrating our contributions to the field. Um, I know particularly it's been a while since I've seen a lot of Black, any Black ecologists. So looking at Black mammologists, like this whole screen right here, it just, it fills me up. It makes me really, my heart really warm. So I guess we can go into introductions. Maybe Christine, you want to start? Sure. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Christine Wilkinson. I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley, and I work with Dr. Maggie Kelly and Dr. Justin Bashares, um, though I'm hoping to graduate in May, so we'll see. Um, so right now I study how spotted hyenas and other large carnivores interact with people, livestock, and human infrastructure, and my specialty is human carnivore conflict, which I know we'll talk a lot about today. Um, and even though I do a lot of work with these fuzzy creatures, I, a good portion of my time is spent working with communities that live with these animals um, to think about effective solutions to human carnivore conflict. Um, but in my opinion, it's really important to remember that us mammologists and wildlife ecologists also have other identities. So personally, I'm black, interracial, queer, I'm an adventurer, an activist, a musician, a friend and a partner. And I just totally want to dedicate my time on this panel to my dog, Champ, who just passed away last night suddenly. It's a crazy time, y'all. So to me, Black Mammologist Week is not only about addressing systemic racism in mammology and other scholarship. Um, it's also about acknowledging the importance and the deep value of these intersectional parts of our identities that shape us as scholars and as conservationists. So for today's Misunderstood Mammal panel, I'll mostly be focusing on spotted hyenas since they're super fascinating and also what I study currently, but reach out to me anytime um, to talk about any of the other things I just mentioned. And I guess I'll just pass it off to uh, Jen. Thanks, Christine. Um, this week has been, we're only in Monday and it's already been incredible. Um, uh, my name is Jen Hunter. Uh, I, uh, I got my PhD in ecology from UC Davis where I studied intraguild competition and predation in carnivores. Um, most recently striped skunks, which is who I'm gonna be representing today. Um, skunks are ubiquitous, they're everywhere. Everybody has a relationship with skunks, whether they like it or not. Um, and so they're really great for me, they've been a really great species to kind of try to teach people about ecology and biology and, and adaptation. Um, so I am currently the director of the Hastings Natural History Reservation, which is a biological field station um, of the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and I am a mother of two. Uh, and I am absolutely thrilled to be partaking in this panel today and be um, part of this week. Um, so I'm going to point the finger at, at Jasmine. Sunny. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sunny. I'm also known as Jasmine. Um, I am a science communicator and reporter, um, and I'm also sort of a master student on hiatus right now. <laughs> um, my studies focus on coyote cognitive ecology and behavioral ecology. Um, I see a huge problem with the obsession with lethal management of coyotes and other similar predators in the United States. And so my studies are focused on learning more about the cognition and the behavior of coyotes in urban environments, rural environments, and in natural landscapes, and seeing how we can take that information and use it to perfect our non-lethal management strategies um, as it, they have been proven time and time again to be more effective than um, lethal uh, strategies. So yeah, and I'm really honored as well to be a part of this, this panel, to be a part of the Black Mammalogist Week in general. Um, being a Black person in the STEM space has brought a lot of challenges, and speaking up about those challenges has brought more challenges. So um, I think that this is an incredibly important time for us to shine a light on Black excellence in mammalogy and STEM and in the world in general, given this new wave of um, Black Lives Matter um, this year. So thank you for joining us. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna be talking about like coyotes, as I said. So uh, yeah, thank you. And I'm gonna give it to Chris. 
Hey, y'all. I also want to agree, just super excited to chat with y'all during Black Mammalogist Week. Um, I also am a mammalogist. I study coyotes and raccoons and urban systems. Um, I'm assistant professor at the University of Washington Tacoma right now. Um, and kind of what Christine was also talking about, I am not just a professor, but also am a father of two in a interracial relationship. I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old son and am very intently thinking about my black boys and their belonging in nature and the ability to be in nature without being judged to, to be outside of that, but to be part of it. So my work spans the fields of urban ecology, social ecological dynamics, human wildlife conflict with the foundational understanding that systemic racism and classism structure the urban landscape and influence the way in which these organisms are responding in cities. And that's especially for our ecosystem sentinels like coyotes, like raccoons that are navigating all of the ways in which we create our urban landscape and what that means for us and what that means for not only urban health, but global health and all of those connections in between. So very much for me, I think I'm going to riff off of Sunny a little bit, but I'll also talk about raccoons because we also colloquially call them trash pandas and don't think of them as anything more than just eating trash, which is totally unfounded. Yes, they will scavenge on anthropogenic food resources when they're available, but raccoons find ways to find ways wherever they are. So that ability, that cognitive capacity is really, really important for them just being ubiquitous across the contiguous 48 states in North America. Awesome. And um, unfortunately, we have one other panelist, Anatish Siaya, who couldn't make it due to being in Namibia, different time zones, etc. So really quick, I'll go over um, about her. She's a research and education manager at the Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia, in north central Namibia, actually. Um, she is going to be speaking to us via recorded video, and she'll be talking about her research with elephants and some misconceptions about elephants. Everyone, my name is Aniki Siaya and I'm from Namibia. I work for an international organization called Cheetah Conservation Fund or CCF for short, which is headquartered here in Namibia. I work as the research and education manager and in this position, I manage an education program called the Future Conservationist of Africa program. This program provides interactive platforms and experiences for young people to learn about Namibia's endangered large cat, the cheetah. This program also aims to increase young people's knowledge of Namibian wildlife and create a positive perception of cheetahs and predators in general. I also assist with research centered around ways communities and predators can coexist harmoniously and I manage the internship program here where both local and international students come to CCF and train in various fields such as wildlife conservation, veterinary studies, agriculture, husbandry, ecology, and genetics. I grew up in Ochivarongo, the closest town to the CCF's research and education center here in Namibia. My first visit to the CCF was when I was 13 years old. And every year after that, my church and my school would bring me and my club to CCF to participate in their environmental education programs. I remember meeting Chewbacca on my first visit, CCF's first and most important ambassador, Cheetah. And young me could not understand why anyone would want to kill such an amazingly beautiful animal. This, among many other memories, stuck with me so long that I knew I wanted to help conserve Namibia's wildlife when I grew up. And fast forward years later, I'm managing the program I participated in as a child. So before my position here at CCF, I studied sex-related feeding preferences in the African elephant, which is scientifically known as Foxondota africana in the Serengeti and Mikumi National Parks in Tanzania. With this study, I wanted to understand why males and females live in separate groups when they are not mating. My findings show that because females require a high quality diet to meet nutritional demands for processes such as pregnancy and lactation, they are very selective in their feeding and are quality driven. 
so female elephants will incorporate a variety of plant species and plant parts in their diet. Whereas males are quantity driven, they will basically eat whatever is palatable and available in large quantities. And because in African savannas, quality and quantity are not always readily available, the result is the temporal and spatial se separation of male and female groups. So one misconception about elephants is that they drink through their trunks. Well, think of the trunk as both a nose and an upper lip. Who wants to drink through their nose, right? So they use their trunks to pick up food and water and put it in their mouth. They also use the trunk to breathe and smell just like any other nose. Another misconception about elephants is that they are naturally aggressive. Well, elephants tend to be aggressive when they feel threatened, and this is especially common in areas where they are, the, where they are oppressed, shot, or harassed. They tend to be peaceful in areas where they feel safe and unthreatened. A cool fact about elephants is that they have great memory. Have you heard the saying, that you have a memory of an elephant? Well, this is because elephant's temporal lobe, the area of the brain associated with memory, is larger and denser, denser than that of humans. My future goals as a conservationist include getting as many young people actively involved in conservation as the future of conservation lies in their hands. I also hope to contribute to finding innovative strategies that promote coexistence between communities and wildlife. This is all from me. Thank you all for listening. That was an awesome video. I really enjoyed watching it. And if you guys have any questions for Anastasia Siaya, then just let us know via our Twitter. You can DM us, you can tweet at us. Um, and you can also ask in the chat and we'll make sure that she gets those questions. Now, let's ask some questions for you guys. Uh, perhaps we'll start with animals. So what mammals, misunderstood, misrepresented mammals do you guys study? I'll pick Jen to go. <laughs> Um, well, um, in the past, I've studied lots of different mammals. Um, I when as I was an undergrad, I did a couple of different research experiences. Um, one of them was to the Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia, where I met Chewbacca the cheetah, um, as we just learned about. Uh, I also uh, studied, and in that program, I studied habitat associations of um, small carnivores in Namibia. Uh, I also studied black and white rough lemurs in Ranamafana National Park in Madagascar. Uh, and then for many years, I was a part of a, a field course that was taught in Honduras, where we did some work with uh, coastal bottlenose dolphins. And then when I came to grad school, I sort of, um, well, my professor sucked me in by saying he had this fantastic project on jaguars in Belize. And I got there and was like, well, I'm ready to go. And he said, well, how do you feel about skunks? Because jaguars, the jaguar project fell through. Um, and it took a minute for sure <laughs> to process that uh, disappointment. But um, so I, I initially started my project uh, in grad school studying sort of the uh, mammalian carnivore guilds broadly and looking at how these sort of meso carnivores manage to exist in this really dangerous matrix of other larger carnivores. And so I did a lot of um, sort of sort of meta analysis type work with that. And I also worked with Sarah Durant and the Serengeti Cheetah Project to analyze some data that she had collected looking at how cheetahs um, of different size, or I'm sorry, age and sex classes um, behave in a way to avoid um, predation and kleptoparasitism, which is stealing of food um, from other larger carnivores like lions and spotted hyenas. Uh, and then I got to skunks uh, where I studied warning coloration. So not skunk ecology or skunk biology. I was really looking at how other predators perceive skunks and how Black, that black and white coloration that warns us all that skunks are dangerous functions in nature. Um, so I did some experiments there 
And, uh, and so now what I'm doing is I'm, I don't have a ton of time for research in my job currently, but what I'm trying to do now is use some other skunk cues like skunk scent and see how that impacts the carnivore community um, here at Hastings, particularly looking at the concentration at which skunk scent is an attractant for other carnivores and at which concentration the skunk scent becomes a repulsion for other carnivores. Um, so that's, those are my mammals. Um, let's go to Christine. All right. Um, so, well, you gave a whole rundown there. So I guess uh, I started out on squirrels, if that's, if we're going way back, um, which I, maybe they're somewhat misunderstood, but I think people generally still like squirrels. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Um, I was looking at their foraging habits. The most interesting thing I saw there, uh, this was at Cornell University, was I saw a squirrel carrying a whole ice cream cone one day on my rounds. So that's kind of fun. Um, I then actually switched to a misunderstood bird, um, the herring gull. So seagulls, as we call them colloquially, everybody think everybody calls them like tra trash birds or like rats of the sky with pigeons. I totally disagree with that. They're amazing. I did a lot of work with them. Then I went back to mammals and um, studied what definitely is a misunderstood mammal, which is the olive baboon, um, very highly implicated in human wildlife conflict in sub-Saharan Africa. I was looking at some uh, STIs that they were facing in an area that was um, kind of straddling a national park in Tanzania and a more human dominated area. And um, then I worked for a while on a project that was protecting chimpanzees, baboons, black and white colobus, and some other species in a very small forest fragment in Uganda. Um, and it, it was really interesting to see the, the differences in perceptions people had about chimpanzees and baboons and just how much more vilified baboons were, even though people were afraid of chimpanzees and afraid of the conflict they were causing. Um, and then now for my, my grad school work, um, which I've been doing for several years in Nakuru, Kenya, I work on spotted hyenas mostly, and also some other large carnivores in Kenya, um, looking at how they move through the landscape and how they are implicated in human wildlife conflict, so human carnivore conflict. Um, and also not just looking at it from, you know, the GPS collar angle and the more ecological side, but also looking at people's perceptions of spotted hyenas and people's perceptions of carnivores and risks from carnivores, which is, you know, equally as important as those actual tangible interactions, if you're thinking about conservation outcomes. So, uh, yeah, definitely super down with the spotted hyenas these days. And um, I recently became part of the hyena specialist group, the IUCN hyena specialist group. And I'm working right now on helping them to um, come up with the new range maps for all four hyena species. There are in fact four hyena species, which we can talk more about later. Um, and that's you know, a huge endeavor they've been working on for a couple of years that I'm kind of taking the torch on to try and, and bring it through to the end. So really excited about that. Um, I will pass it to Chris. Awesome, thanks Christine and Jen. So yeah, I didn't, start on misunderstood mammals, but actually started on misunderstood inverts. So the first species I ever studied in my undergrad at Columbia were these tarantula species out in the Dominican, which none of y'all would believe me right now if I told you that they were cute, but they were, they were super cute. Tarantulas can be cute too. So um, been working on species that have really been misunderstood in many different ways since then. Um, transitioned from working on tarantulas in the Dominican to working on zebra finches, in more of a lab setting, but trying to understand their differences, individual differences in behavior, AKA animal personality, which yes, animals have personality and they all show differences, which is likely something you all already know on this call. And then went immediately from my undergrad to grad work at University of Chicago into coyotes. And my now advisor at the time was potential advisor had told me this story about a coyote that got into a Quiznos in downtown Chicago. And as the coyote walked into the Quiznos, it walked into the cooler and sat there for a good 50 minutes before animal control came to get it. And the patrons that were eating there, as well as the folks that were back working the desk, all slowly backed out of said Quiznos. So that sparked my research now up into coyotes and how they adapt to people. So all of my grad work at UChicago was trying to see how parents raise their puppies in an anthropogenic environment? How do they transcribe greater boldness, greater tolerance, greater habituation 
to people so that way they can navigate cities and not feel what you normally would see from a coyote. If they see you from 300 yards away, they run in the opposite direction, normally in non-urban systems. In cities, they sit and they watch you. So quite literally, right out of the pages of a Jurassic Park movie. Uh, so many of the studies that I do now at the University of Washington Tacoma is taking a look at all of the angles of the coyote's environment and couch that into the way the animals are behaving individually and as a population. So that means, for instance, we do a lot of community engaged research where we use camera traps paired with community surveys to see where the overlaps are between the number of domestic cats that are left outdoors and where most of the coyotes are in Tacoma. Newsflash, there's a huge overlap and the people that have outdoor cats tend to think that coyotes are dangerous, that they shouldn't be in the environment and that they have no use. So those are one of the kind of like biggest misunderstoods is the fact that coyotes are not useful in our environment, but they are more or less kind of to steal from, from Batman. Um, they're the heroes that we need. Certainly the heroes that I want, but you know, others in the, in the community may not think so. Um, and same with raccoons. So we're doing the same with raccoons, but seeing where most of the conflict occurs in terms of how they're able to get in folks' houses, if there's any conflict between them and say, for instance, if you have livestock like chickens um, and where there may be latrines. And all of that deals with the way in which we deal with and utilize and dispose of our trash and how we maintain those systems and how those systems themselves sometimes go beyond the individual human. So it very much, you get down the rabbit hole of, all right, well, we need to make some real structural changes, which is 90% the people and very much less about the, the animals. But Coyotes and raccoons all day. Um, and for that, actually, that segue leads straight up into Sunny. So take it away, Sunny. All right. Um, well, uh, I my journey into mammalogy began, well, academically and research-wise, began back in 2015, 2014. Um, I was a lab and field assistant in um, the Macaulay lab at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, the lab was focused on researching wildebeest ecology and movement as it relates to their surrounding environment and predators. And so I worked in the lab for about a year and I was so privileged to um, be able to go and join them in the field research for about three months in Serengeti National Park and um, just observe the animals during the Great Migration. And so we got to do a lot of work with drones, got to do a lot of work with camera traps. I learned a lot about predators, but also about the prey ungulates there, um, ungulates being hooved animals. And from there, um, my research went into, or my work in research went to learning more about mammal populations in Southern California and how that relates to the distribution of tick-borne species or tick-borne uh, diseases. Um, because as urbanization continues to push into natural landscapes, the chances of catching zoonotic diseases and having those passing between domestic animals and uh, wildlife uh, is, is greatly increased. And so we were looking at where those tick-borne species were originating, which specific mammal populations were carrying those, and how that related to um, more urbanized environments. From then on, I moved into inverts. Um, and I spent about a year and a half to two years studying mosquitoes. Um, and so that was really, really cool. Um, I got to work in a lab at the University of California, Irvine um, in the Anthony James lab, studying um, genetic modification of mosquitoes and how that can be used to um, combat malaria and other mosquito-borne illnesses. And that some like surprisingly has been able to overlap actually quite well with my journey into coyotes, which I'm still in now. So as a master's student at the American Public University, um, I study environmental policy and management. And I kind of stumbled upon the my studies with coyotes because originally I was looking at urban gardens <laughs> because I was looking at how um, just bringing into how, how we can incorporate more natural landscapes and natural life into the urban environment. But when I was looking at species that did not have adequate or widespread um, management plans, specifically adaptive management plans, I started finding more and more about the coyote and how people really 
don't like the coyote at all. And so I, I really got interested in the overlap between um, kind of how everybody is saying between uh, human wildlife conflict, how social norms affect the way that we interact with wildlife, specifically severely misunderstood animals like the coyote. Um, and I've been learning about how public hatred for the coyote is deeply, deeply rooted in European imperialism and then began back in the 1800s. Um, and it still is very much alive and well in our policies today. And so there are a lot of um, social implications and cultural implications in the way that we view and interact with and manage wildlife. And so I want to uncover those, um, uncover those issues and begin to try to get us forward into working into non-lethal um, management where we see these animals as valuable to their ecosystems, but also to kind of like Chris was saying, it, uh, valuable to our urbanized landscapes as well. So yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I also study coyotes, raccoons using camera traps. So I particularly love um, Dr. Shell's stuff right there. So actually let's go into a little bit of a deeper to topic right here. Um, how would you say working with your misunderstood mammal kind of represents how you actually experience the field of mammalogy as a Black scholar? And I guess I will start with Christine. All right, thanks, Asia. Um, so I guess I, I didn't actually say all the different reasons why the spotted hyenas that I study are so misunderstood. Um, and there are many, I mean, wow, probably one of the most misunderstood animals on the planet. In lots of cultures, there are stories about them being evil or being stupid. I mean, even in our own, look at what you know Disney did, look at the Lion King, right? Um, that's how they're portrayed. And there are a lot of inaccurate things about that, which I could talk for days about, maybe until you get bored. Um, they're also, you know, known as greedy scavengers. People think that they're hermaphrodites and there's a lot of lore around that as well. Um, when in fact, you know, they're very intelligent. So they kill most of their prey, they're apex predators. Lions are more likely to steal from them than the other way around. Um, you know, a number of things like that. And, you know, that's not to say that, that they don't have a history of conflict, you know, they, they are very um, adaptable to human landscapes. So they do thrive there and, and that can cause some tension, even if it's just uh, the tension of fear, right? Um, and I think that that's kind of what it all goes back to in many ways for me is it's all about fear. A lot of the things about human wildlife conflict that we talk about are less about the animal and more about people's perceptions and more about um, even historical, like socioeconomic and sociopolitical contexts that we're thinking about there, we call them human human conflicts that are behind all of these human wildlife conflicts. And you can kind of start to branch out and see this, this story that's a lot bigger than just this, this misunderstood animal. Um, and so for my path as, as a black scholar, I feel like there are a lot of things that, that I didn't really get to experience growing up um, because of the, the histories of systemic racism here in the country. Um, my ancestors are slaves, like my mom's side of the family um, have slave ancestry. And, uh, you know, I grew up thinking about like wanting to go outside and go camping and things like that. And, and we never really did that. And I, I didn't really think about it until later as a, as a thing that could have been rooted in some of those, those histories of excluding people from the outdoors. Um, and so like kind of that connection to wildlife was over and over again hampered for me in those ways. Um, and even you know, getting in the outdoors in other ways, um, trying to go swimming. Like I remember that um, a relative or a family friend taught us to swim once on a vacation and my mom never knew how to swim. And I was always trying to teach her how to swim. And I don't, I don't think she ever really learned um, even though she really wanted to. Um, she was really afraid of it. And I learned when I was an adult that there were all of these issues with segregation at pools where black people just didn't get to swim. And so that's like a legacy. And there's all these paths that I've learned as I've gotten older that, that have created these, I think for me, I've been pretty privileged. So I think they've been relatively small barriers for me, um, just as someone who is really dogmatic and, and trying to get what they want. But I can see them now in all of these contexts. Um, all of my role models working with wildlife growing up were uh, these white guys on TV, you know, on Animal Planet and Discovery Channel. And they were great. 
Um, but you know, I, I honestly wish I had had a, a black mammologist's week to look at when I was younger because I didn't know how to become, how to go from my background to being, you know, the next Jeff Corwin on TV. So, um, you know, for me, it, I, it was just a lot of uh, luck and opportunity and, and one specific person that really helped me to get into this field more. Um, and her name is Dr. Myra Schulman. Uh, she's based at Cornell University. And I guess uh, the summer before I started my undergrad, they were running a program for, you know, incoming undergrads out on Shoals Marine Laboratory in um, off the coast of Maine, where we started to work with, um, you know, marine animals and plants. So I think uh, without her, because she was kind of there every step of the way and like looking for different grants to apply for DEI type grants and, you know, empowering type grants for students of color um, throughout my whole college career. I, I, I really am not convinced that I would be where I am right now um, at, because of all of those barriers that, that we face as people of color in this particular field. I mean, it, especially in the USA, it's just a historically white field. It still is a very white field, um, white men mostly, um, but that is you know, thankfully changing and hopefully we can help to inspire even like a, a younger generation to, to come up and be in this field with us. Uh, I guess I'll pass it to Sunny. Okay, so a um, couple of things for my experience as a black person in STEM, specifically as it relates to coyotes. Um, as I mentioned, the way that the general Western society, I'm gonna keep it Western for this, um, has viewed coyotes and the way our policies have been shaped around this species has is, is deeply rooted in um, European imperialism. Um, it began back in the 1800s um, when more than 3 million European families were colonizing the North America. And you know they drove prey species like the elk, um, like bison, uh, down to dangerously no, low numbers. And that caused wolves and coyotes to begin feeding on livestock. And so that began this huge campaign to target um, predators. And, you know, that kind of began the culture of um, what, what is known today as the coyote hunting derbies, you know, these competitions for targeting the biggest or the most coyotes and getting rewards for it and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, in, in that history also lies our ideology, and I'm talking generally in the U.S., it also lies our ideology and how we view this particular species and its place in the ecosystem. Um, as you were saying, Christine, about the, the hyena, a lot of people view it as just this scavenger, as, as a dirty animal. It doesn't belong here. We need to just get rid of it. Um, and, you know, in recent years, public sentiment has began to get a little bit more positive. However, surveys still are showing that people still believe that, yes, they're nice for the ecosystem, but I don't want them anywhere around me. Um, and truthfully, as a Black woman, I really feel for this species, and I feel that there is a parallel between Black existence in the United States and, um, you know, the existence of coyotes in the United States, because we were put in a situation, A, that we didn't want to be in, <laughs> but B, that we also didn't have any control over, and historically, we have continued to be punished for that, um, and so, you know, I see all of these misinterpretations, these misunderstandings towards coyotes and the villainization of coyotes. And even though they're just persisting in the way that they do naturally, and they're doing the best that they can with the pressures that we've imposed upon them, we still don't want to see um, any changes just because of this European history, because of this deeply rooted ideology. We don't want to talk about why lethal management doesn't work. We don't want to talk about the research as it applies, as it shows that non-lethal management works. Um, and this is all, it, multiple studies have shown that the, continue, the continued support for lethal management, um, as I said, is still, it's very much driven by societal norms, even when people do see that it works, because multiple studies have shown that. Um, even, even the participants in those studies that have shown um, that non-lethal management works uh, continue to, they go back to lethal management after the study is over because of these cultural norms. And so um, I just feel that as a Black woman, I very much relate 
to that because we are crying out. Our, our, our community has been crying out for decades, you know, and, and we say, you know, the, po the policing in the way that it is does not work. Um, you know, redlining has been around historically. It does not work. It hurts people. Um, and, and, you know, we protest, we protest silently, we protest with clothing, we do all of these different things, but still we are punished for it and nobody wants to talk about, um, you know, how, why these things are not working, the deep historical roots of these things. Um, I, you know, as you were talking about, Christine, your, your family has slave ancestry and, you know, you were directly exposed to those um, societal and ideolo ideological pressures. My grandma went to segregated schools growing up in Louisiana. And so like, these are things that are still affecting us um, today, but you know, they're because of cultural norms, we just don't want to talk about it. And so for me, that's how my, um, that's kind of how I relate to coyotes in that way. And why it's so important to me to, to, to shed light on these cultural issues and, and really get us towards the path of like true scientific understanding and applying those things. Um, I'll go ahead and give it to Chris. Awesome. Yeah, kind of to build on what Sunny was talking about um, and just think about carnivores generally, we oftentimes, even though just thinking about abundances, they are not nearly as abundant as all the invertebrates or all of the birds or all of the herps. We use mammals as beacons for conservation. And that oftentimes may be that we think about carnivores a lot as those means or modes of conservation status, which gets us back to the historical underpinnings of what we even consider to be conservation, which many of the forefathers of the conservationist and environmentalist movements were thinking about how nature should be nature for nature's sake, meaning that no people should exist in nature, whatever that meant, pretty much just green spaces, but only exist for the recreation of white men. And that particular narrative has been fraught with so many inconsistencies and falsehoods, but also structural violence and harm to the point that the very founding of conservation for mammals was done in a way that doesn't actually help the mammals in the first place because it was based and rooted in structural racism and classism. So what does that mean for say carnivores? Well, oftentimes we think about carnivores as being predators, apex predators that regulate different communities and how they influence top-down processes like wolves, for instance, right? So for me, wolves are my first love. I remember when I was five watching Nat Geo shows about wolves, but most of the hosts were all white dudes. And many of the folks that were in my community, I grew up in Los Angeles, you as a black person tell them you're interested in science. They say, oh, okay, cool, awesome. You'll be a great medical doctor. I tried that. Didn't work. I, I was not was not feeling that um, because of the fact that I felt very much that looking at macroecology and the way in which these organisms like wolves, like spotted hyenas, like coyotes help us to regulate our ecosystems. What Sunny I think hit the nail on the head with was this idea that we oftentimes think of carnivores outside of the system that they're necessary, but that they can't exist around us. Here's the kicker. As urbanization continues to spread more and more and more, and the human population continues to grow exponentially, we no longer have a choice where we can live separately from them. That's not even closely or remotely realistic. So some of the biggest misunderstandings of many, and I recognize we have a lot of carnivore biologists on here, but many mammals generally, is this understanding that we can keep our separate distance from those populations and then come in whenever we want, kind of parachute science. That ideology fundamentally was based in Aldo Leopold, John Muir, their thinkings of what we should do to conserve species. When really, it should be noted here, everybody on this panel, right? We are stolen people on stolen lands. For years, <laughs> centuries, there were ways in which native and indigenous communities were able to live and coexist side by side with mammals. And because of Western settler colonialism, we have thought that we can live separate from. That's not the case anymore. It, it certainly is not. And especially through, say, coyotes or raccoons, they show us ways in which they themselves embody the Black experience. They are in new environments that they aren't necessarily used to, but they find a way to scrap and make it work wherever they are. 
We have coyotes in the West. We have coyotes in the East. They used to be mostly in the Great Plains of America, but now they're everywhere. They're in Mexico and Canada too. They're, they're literally finding ways to adapt, Jeff Goldblum style. That is superbly endearing. Um, rather than seeing it as they're a pest, they need to be taken into consideration or how do we control them? Same thing with, say for instance, raccoons, which now it should be noted, there are non-native populations of raccoons in Germany and Japan as well. And they have found ways to make it in those very, very different environments. That is something certainly I think that we need to take into account when we're thinking about not just how these animals persist in these landscapes and how they're trying to make a way when we are changing everything like that, but also the fact that because they're able to find that way, it tells us more about ourselves and our system. So then that way we can take pride in the fact of these animals are able to make it work. We should be able to too. It's not like we don't have the tools. We just need to make the choice to do so. Pass it over to Jen. Actually, before Jen goes, I just want to um, make sure that you know, you actually have a question from someone on the um, in the chat. Uh, Carissa also wants to know, in addition to how your experiences as a black scholar um, kind of mesh with your with your misunderstood mammal, they also want to know, was there an advantage to skunks having more white or less white? Did you find that? Me? I, I hope. Um, you know, uh, that's a really great question. And a lot of people, um, there's some confusion. Uh oh, am I muted still? I can't tell. No. Okay, good. Um, there's uh, this, the population of skunks that I worked with didn't have a lot of variation in the black and whiteness. So I worked, um, my research sites were all through California. Um, and I would not, I never saw a, a skunk that did not have really, really similar striping patterns. There are other places where that's not the case. And it's not really clear why that is. And one of the reasons that could potentially be at play is that that black and white coloration um, is really, really designed to be maximally visible to the widest range of predators possible. So if you're a skunk and you could potentially be killed by a bear or a mountain lion or um, a fox, like you need to be able to be visual to the, be, be visible to the visual systems that bears and mountain lions and foxes have. Um, and so in some places where that selection pressure is less, like maybe there's a place where there aren't a lot of predatory um, felids and maybe the selection pressure um, changes if you don't live in a place that's got coyotes. Uh, and so in places where the predator community is different, you might have incidents where um, the coloration varies a lot. Um, I'm not sure that it's ever been studied. I know there, uh, Luann Johnson is a biologist in Massachusetts and worked on Martha's Vineyard with skunks for a long time. And she had a lot of variation in her populations. Uh, but I think that there weren't a lot of coyotes on Martha's Vineyard. And so possibly that's it. I'm not totally sure. Um, and then to the question, the previous question. Um, so I don't know that I really, uh, feel a lot of like camaraderie with the skunk necessarily. Um, I do appreciate their attitude. Um, and if I could sort of summarize the attitude of a skunk in one word, it would be unbothered. Like they cannot, they're not concerned about you. They're not concerned about your car. They're not concerned about their predators. They're gonna live their lives. They're gonna do their thing. They're gonna be their best selves every moment of every day, <laughs> come what may. Um, and for me actually ending up studying skunks is like, Sort of that meso carnivore community is I really um, sort of honed in on largely because um, when you so when I was in grad school I was in grad school in the early 2000s um, and if you think there aren't a lot of black mammologists now uh, you should have seen the state of things only you know 10 15 years ago um, and working with large carnivores was really intimidating when you're not sort of the typical face of large carnivores. And it's a, I worked with some incredible, kind, thoughtful, engaging people, but at the same time, feeling that feeling of always being sort of the outsider and not belonging, it was hard for me as a young person to really kind of have the confidence that I needed to really make an impact with some of those really big sort of charismatic species because there is kind of a hierarchy in terms of um, your mammals and you know it's more probably a self-reflection than anything else but you know the the, the personalities who study really large carnivores 
large felids is a certain group of people. And then you've got the primate people and you've got marine mammal, marine mammal people. And there can be some really strong personalities in that group. And I just didn't have the confidence at that age to really like, you know, put a flag in the soil and say, this is the thing I'm going to do. And so I was so pleased to find skunks and to kind of um, meso carnivores in general and to kind of um, kind of burrow in in that space. Awesome. Um, another public question from the chat. Uh, Zoe would like to know what advice would you give to those who study misunderstood mammals in terms of how to get people to begin to change their minds about these critters? And I'll ask uh, Sunny to answer that one. Um, that one is a bit tough. So I'll start with the first half. Um, how to get, it was, it was along the lines of how to get started in studying misunderstood mammals. Kind of it work. was more, what advice would you give to those who study misunderstood mammals? Okay. In terms of how it gain people to begin to change their minds about the animals. So I would say, um, firstly, don't get stuck in the idea that this needs to be done in a certain way. Um, that there is some kind of template for starting to study misunderstood mammals. And, and what, even if your mammal is like one of the most charismatic species, you know, if you're studying a tiger that everybody loves or, you know, animals like that, um, just remember that there is no specific template to go on. Um, I have to learn that the hard way and I am still learning that. I graduated in 2015 from my undergrad um, and I had been applying for jobs in um, as a wildlife biologist, as a research assistant, and I never got anything in my specific field. I did get to work in a lab um, per, for, for pay, <laughs> like as a paid assistant um, with, as I said, at UCI, um, but I've always been focused on mammals and I have never gotten an opportunity to actually work professionally. Um, and so I had to kind of carve my own way. And, and then that's how I kind of got into being a writer right now. So I would definitely say, please, you know, give yourself the freedom of understanding there is no specific route to go um, and that there are no specific authorities that have, you know, that have this, uh, the power to say, you know, you should do this or you should do, do that. You shouldn't talk about. I've talked to researchers um, about specifically when it comes to coyotes about the rebound effect and how that is specifically a part of why lethal management doesn't work. Um, and prominent researchers that I definitely still respect um, uh, disagree that because, you know, when I speak to them about, you know, this is why lethal management doesn't work, you know, coyote populations will continue to grow if we keep uh, shooting them down. Um, and this rebound effect happens in more ways than just population growth, but also um, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of ecology. Um, when I talk to them about those things, they just say, oh, that's not true. And, but it's like the research shows it. So, you know, the people that you, um, I will say the people that you may look up to as mammalogists definitely still have merit. However, they are not the they do not have the final word on how you will go about studying misunderstood mammals and how you will go about um, teaching people about misunderstood mammals. Uh, as far as teaching people about them, that is something that you need to be adaptive with. Um, I'm still kind of learning how to teach people about the coyotes because this is a very di uh, divisive topic. Um, and so I would definitely say first, get into why your mammal is misunderstood. You need to understand the social, uh, the social uh, aspects of why it's understood. You need to understand the cultural, um, the historical aspects. Then you need to move on to policy, um, move on to economics because the, when it comes to misunderstood mammals, they're, the reason that they are so divisive is because of the misconceptions about them are deeply rooted in multiple facets of society and multiple facets of our lives. And so when you're beginning to educate people about this, you need to have your facts. <laughs> you need to have, be covered on every angle. And it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to not have all the answers, 
But, you know, if, if somebody comes at you with like, oh, well, you know, coyotes um, killing them, you know, helps the deer populations. Well, then you can say, no, it actually doesn't because coyotes only hunt deer when they're in packs and they have a very diverse lifestyle. Some live on their own, some don't. So, you know, you need to be able to cover yourself on every angle. You need to be able to educate people effectively and truthfully and accurately. Um, and then I would also say, along with that, don't get too stuck on the academic side. Um, you don't need to be an academic to educate people about misunderstood mammals. Um, you don't need to be to have, you know, this huge notoriety. All you need to do is know your facts. And you also need to understand you need to be empathetic when you communicate to people about it. And that's something that I'm still getting a handle on because part of the reason coyotes are so divisive um, is because they deeply impact the lives of agricultural professionals, so people who own livestock. And although, you know, the coyotes role in depredation against livestock um, is extremely exaggerated. For example, in 2010, they were only uh, accountable for less than 3% of livestock that were lost that year um, and in the years preceding. So, you know, it's extremely exaggerated. However, along with that, I need to be empathetic to those agricultural professionals when I'm talking to them about this. You know, I can't just go out and say, well, coyotes aren't that big of a deal. You know, it doesn't actually matter. Um, you're just complaining. Like, no, I need to understand that this is impacting this person's life. They may have lost a significant amount of their income because of coyote depredation. Um, but just because I know that on a national scale uh, that they are, that this impact is widely exaggerated does not mean that I need to invalidate what that person is experiencing with this animal. So you need to come from a place of empathy, um, but also factuality so you can um, communicate accurately, but in a way that is sensitive to how people may view the animal that you're speaking about. That was awesome, Sunny. And I just wanna add a tiny tidbit about that empathy part is, is what she's really touching on there is the human-human conflicts I was talking about earlier. A lot of the time, yes, there's some cultural aspects that make certain mammals misunderstood, but often that the mammals are representing a much deeper, deeper historical context. And so something else you have to be, I think kind of okay with in this field is that like, if you're having true empathy and you, you've got your facts in your pocket and you're not throwing them at people, sometimes people are not going to change their minds about your misunderstood mammal. And, and that's okay. Like that, the culture is a very deep seated part of, of humans. Right. And um, we have to be empathetic to each other in order to make compromises and get things done without thinking that we're going to change everybody's mind about, about these mammals. Um, and so, yeah, Sunny definitely hit the nail on the head with just looking deeper into the history of, of what these mammals are really representing um, and having that empathy ready to go, but also being able to, to kind of let go of convincing people if you have to. That's, uh, you guys answered it perfectly in my view. So, um, okay, so one last question, really short one or two sentences, what are you guys hoping that people will get from Misunderstood Mammal Monday and from this panel? Um, let's start with Jen. Um, I hope that people uh, can see themselves in these types of jobs. That's my goal. Like that's the thing that um, I've been thinking about uh, for a long time. And I, I'm happy to be put a new face on mammologists and field biology in general and to show folks that there are people like them out here doing these jobs. And I'll go to Chris. Yeah, really simply, your experiences and the way in which you grew up, where you grew up, how you grew up, who you are, your identity is all important to this conversation because of the fact that the greater diversity and inclusion that we have in understanding mammals, the greater diversity and greater understanding that we have of ourselves and the two go hand in hand. So bring those experiences with you. They're more valuable than you realize. I guess I can go. Um, on that note, yeah, I would say that I really hope that uh, Misunderstood Mammal Monday and all the days we have planned in Black Mammalogist Week in general will provide people with an opportunity to connect with folks who look like them, who have similar experiences to them. Um, I think that Black Mammalogists Week of all of these amazing weeks that have happened over the past few months, starting with Black Birders Week, 
I think that it's um, a really special week because in, at least in the history of the USA, but I think more broadly globally, mammals are that beacon that conservation is oriented around. And so if we can increase diversity of experience in mammalogy and in wildlife ecology and conservation, we're gonna be impacting conservation more broadly, very quickly. I would say birds and mammals are the things that so much conservation policy is made about. So hopefully, um, you know, this kind of situation this week can be um, an entry point for folks who are feeling iffy about it or folks who are very young and aspiring mammologists or conservation biologists that they'll know that we're here and that we can connect with them. Sunny. Um, I believe that as far as the human side, um, I just want to say to existing and aspiring Black mammologists um, that you matter, your experiences matter, your experiences are valid. Um, please do not allow yourself to be um, gaslighted as far as um, when, uh, your experiences with inequality in STEM in general, whether that's the workplace, whether that's in academia. Um, and then on top of that, what I'm hoping you can get out of Misunderstood Mammal Monday and as well as the rest of the week is that there is a space for you, there is a need for you, um, and that nobody, whether you're an academic or not, um, nobody has the power to tell you how you're going to go about your journey in studying mammals. If you need to, if this is your um, this is your passion, then you can carve your own way and you need to surround yourself with excellence. Um, and uh, yeah, you are excellent in and of yourself. And I hope that this week inspires you and that you just get the most out of everything that we're trying to give you this week. So thank you for, for joining us. Yes, I'll um, <clears throat> riff off of Sunny with saying thank you for joining us. We hope that you enjoy this panel, but um, this is not the only thing that's happening this week. Obviously, we got a whole week of events happening on Twitter, on Instagram, and um, maybe Christine can very quickly tell us about some, maybe two or three things that she's really excited about. Yeah, thanks, Asia. Um, yeah, thank you all. We've all been working so hard on Black Homologists Week, and we really hope that we can connect with everybody and make some sort of tangible impact. Um, something related to Misunderstood Mammal Monday that I really wanted to call out is I wanted to have my favorite Black spotted hyena ecologist here in the whole world. His name is Benson. He's Maasai, and he works with Kay Holocamp's Mara Hyena Project. Um, but he couldn't be here, so he's on a podcast that our friend Taiki James did that'll come out later this week. So keep your eye on that. He'll be talking about hyenas. Um, we have a bunch of stuff coming up. Keep your eye on our website, on our Twitter. Um, we have giveaways every single day that you can just engage with the tweets and you'll be eligible for a giveaway. And um, I know people were asking about mentorship opportunities. Uh, Wednesday is We Out Here Wednesday and we're gonna have several ways to get connected with mentors and mentees. Um, that you'll see on our website and also on the Twitter. And then last, but I think most importantly for me is we are working on establishing the Black Mammologists Week BIPOC Scholar Award with the American Society of Mammologists, who's one of our partners. Um, and we're in discussions with them and we have a GoFundMe out there to try and establish our $60,000 endowment. Um, and we're hoping the momentum from this week will help us to do that so that we can have this award, the scholarship available for Black and Indigenous mammologists and wildlife ecologists going forward into the future um, in perpetuity, we hope. So help us out with that and definitely let us know if you have any questions. We're all, I think most of us are on Twitter. I'm doing a takeover today on Real Scientists on Twitter. You can ask me anything you like and we're, we're here for you. Yeah, just really quickly, we've already got $3,000 raised on that scholarship. So I think we're doing pretty well. Um, so again, thank you guys for joining us and we hope that you continue enjoying Black Mammalogist Week. We'll see you. Thank you.